Uh, I'd like to welcome Dave Morin up to the stage, and uh, he's been around the Valley for quite a while. Uh, better than Apple of, uh, of Facebook. Uh, he's been an entrepreneur and now a venture capital investor. Please give it up for Dave Morin. Am I, am I on? All right. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. So, uh, so of the roles that you've played, entrepreneur, uh, angel investor, VC, uh, I guess, you know, man about town, what's most fun for you? What's most fun? Um, I, I just love creating things and um, making products and pushing the world forward. Um, I think that what makes it awesome to live in Silicon Valley is uh, if you want to be, you can be very curious and learn uh, a lot of amazing new things. Um, and uh, for that reason, I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying uh, uh, the investing role right now um, because you, uh, I've, I've always kind of loved learning and um, you know, making things and um, helping people uh, think in different ways. And so I think that the, uh, the investing role really makes that fun. So, um, What do you think is different now in role as a professional investor from when you were kind of dabbling, doing your own angel investments? Uh, do you feel that you have a higher bar to sort of hit now as a professional investor versus just amateur whenever you want to? Yeah, I mean, I think that as you uh, evolve in the investing role, um, you, you, you know, you, you sort of move, I think of it as moving up the curve. Uh, when I started, uh, I started in 2009, um, and I was investing by myself uh, with my own capital, and, uh, you know, very small checks, 10K, 25K. Um, I grew up in Montana, um, and, you know. A hotbed of startup investing, yeah. I hear. My mom never made more than $25,000 a year, and, um, you know, we were on welfare when I was a kid. And so to be investing 25K into a startup was uh, uh, muscle memory that I needed to develop because I didn't have it. And so um, that's kind of where I started. And as time goes on, you know, you get used to working with larger amounts of capital. And um, I named the firm Slow Ventures uh, for a couple reasons, but one of them was that my sense was that becoming good at this uh, is a craft, and it just takes real time and real, uh, you know, focus, and and not just like over a short time period. You know, you see a lot of this happen where people will come in guns a blazing, uh, doing a few angel investments, and uh, and and kind of uh, shoot uh, shoot out and out the other side, and you won't see them again. And so I, uh, you know, I've always been very long term focused in this. That for me that that. You know, I wanted to give back to the Silicon Valley ecosystem and get good at this over the long term. And so I think that as you do that, you just get better at pattern matching. You know, you hear these words all the time, pattern matching, and you know, wh what makes a great founder, what makes a great company, which patterns of execution work in different sectors and don't work in others. Um, you know, today, uh, Slow Ventures has about 100 million under management. We have about 250 companies um, in our portfolio. 250, that sounds like far too many to keep track of. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we think of it as an ecosystem. And, um, you know, and I know you think about that a lot, and we've had lots of conversations okay. about it over the last decade. But um, that's kind of uh, where we are now. And I think that that's just a product of, you know, uh, practice and staying focused on just getting better over time. You, you worked at two uh, iconic companies in the Valley, both Apple and Facebook, and you spent a lot of years at Facebook working on platform, working with the product team, uh, working with Zuck. Uh, what do you think those experiences have taught you about investing? Uh, and I guess I might throw the you know, experience as an entrepreneur path also in there. So you know, do you feel like you got an insight into the entrepreneurial experience from you know, working at Facebook on running path? When I joined Apple, we couldn't sell the iPod to anyone, which no, I know, I'm hearing people laugh. Yeah, I know the, I, the iPod was Nobody such a remembers this. terrible like, product. The hardly, first, hardly anybody used that. The first two years, um, there was no iTunes. You had to rip music off of CDs uh, to put them onto the iPod. Could only hold a thousand songs. 
Um, and you know, one of the first things that I did when I joined Apple is we gave away iPods to every student at Duke uh, in order to get them to use them. Um, <laughs> which nobody remembers this, right? And the That's story now expensive, is- expensive uh, product giveaway though. Yeah, well, at the time it was a marketing initiative and you know, we wanted students to try using it for uh, educational content for their lectures, for you know all these ideas that at the time seemed kind of radical. And um, you know, I guess what that lesson taught me is that you know it, to make real progress in the world, um, it takes an investment that takes time, right? And so if we zoom forward to today, and you look at Apple, and the way that the uh, you know the zeitgeist is sort of responding, say to the Apple Watch. You know, it's barely a year old. Uh, people are already declaring it a failure. Um, and you know, what, what I think people don't know is that Apple's sitting there thinking about this as a 10-year investment, right? And that this is just year one uh, of an investment in health that will, you know, probably by Apple Watch version 10 or five or whatever we get to in 10 years, um, will be pretty profound. Um, and so, you know, I think that was one of the uh, one of the lessons I think that I learned from Apple was just the um, dedication to long-term thinking and long-term investing and being willing to spend enough time to not just launch the first product but to you know work with customers and stay focused on your customers and what they how they respond to your product and continue to invest until you uh, get it to a, 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 a lot of people um, and so that I don't know that's an Apple lesson I don't know if you want to talk about Facebook lessons but well I think that you know one approach that both companies have been popular, uh, have been successful at, has been using a platform to then sell other third-party apps and uh, services. So with, you know, both with iTunes and then with the App Store, uh, Apple has developed a huge, you know, third-party application and content platform, uh, which is actually kind of interesting. I think if, you know, for folks who are a little bit older in the room, you might they might remember that Steve Jobs was actually not the most uh, you know, sort of ecosystem friendly uh, CEO in the early days. I think he was maniacal about controlling a lot of that platform. You mean very early days, like Mac, yeah, the yeah, original Mac. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, whereas I think, you know, kind of a completely different, you know, framework when you see kind of how many apps and services are being sold, like how many music and content providers are on iTunes uh, and how many sort of application developers. Um, you got, you were like early days involved in Facebook. How did you view sort of the developer platform and you know third party market when you were getting that off the ground? Uh, just a quick side note on on Apple and Steve. Uh, when I was at Apple, Steve had this poster. It was like a frame that said it was like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it was like it was Apple's hierarchy of needs, and it was <laughs> food, water, developers. Uh, oh really? <laughs> yeah, and so. It, it, it's kind of emblazoned in my mind. Um, and when we were at Facebook, um, you know, I, I went, I left Apple to go to Facebook to work on the platform project. Um, Terrible choice. And, <laughs> and um, the reason was that while I was at Apple, we were trying, I was trying to convince um, Apple and various people there that we should uh, turn Mac OS X at the time into a social operating system and we should replace the contacts with Facebook. Um, problem was Facebook was only 5 million users at the time um, and so MySpace was like 100 million and everybody was saying that MySpace was going to take out iTunes and that it was game over. Yeah. Uh, and how, um, how times change. Yeah, and we decided instead, I just, you know, Dustin Moskovitz actually uh, amongst other people recruited me to f Facebook to work on the platform project and um, our goal was to turn Facebook into an operating system. Um, and uh, you know, we spent a year on it, launched it in 2007 and um, you know, it was pretty amazing because I remember sitting on the stage the night we were uh, gonna launch uh, the product with Mark Zuckerberg and we were saying, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we had 5,000 developers show up um, <laughs> to work on this? I mean, legitimately, because if you remember back then, there was iGoogle, it was a widget, uh, there was a widget directory on iGoogle, there was another, uh, a French startup, I can't remember what it was called, that had a, a widget uh, experience yeah. um, that was like a homepage, kind of like iGoogle. And those directories were 5,000, uh, you know, and uh, Apple had 250,000 developers, but they had built that up over 30 years. And so, 
we were saying to ourselves, like, there's just no way that we'll attract more than 5,000 developers because that was the largest web-based widget directory that there was. Sort of overshot that a little bit. Yeah, we ended up in a year with 500,000, um, which was double, you know, Apple's uh, number of developers. And, um, you know, within three days, I think you probably remember this, but we had apps that had a million users in 24 hours. And I remember it well. I was teaching a class at Stanford that summer, and we decided to kind of use Facebook as a Petri dish. And we, amazingly, were thinking that, okay, maybe some of the students would have applications with 10,000 users. We might get lucky enough to have a few with 100,000. I think one of them ended up with a million. We yeah. had over five teams that had million user yeah. applications. Uh, several of them ended up making hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising. One of them made close to a million dollars. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, I remember teaching that class. You were, you were one <laughs> yeah. of our speakers. And one of the companies that came out of that, uh, ShareThrough, is now a company, I think, doing probably over 50 million in revenue. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I guess the, the question you asked was one of lessons and how do those apply to the investing world. I think that, um, you know, what the platform did for us at Facebook and what it did for Apple uh, with the iPhone, for example, is it enables you to scale to a number of use cases which are impossible to serve by yourself. Um, and you see this happen a lot in the ecosystem. You see it happening right now with Twitter, for example, um, where they're not a platform. And so you, know, you kind of hit this maximum uh, point where you can't grow any bigger than that. Um, and if you look at the companies that have successfully transitioned into becoming platforms, whether it's Apple and the extreme case, because they own an operating system, but if you look at the more web-based companies or social networking-based companies like uh, Facebook or Tencent in China with WeChat, these are companies that have successfully transitioned these products into becoming platforms which other developers can build on top of and then serve like a dramatically larger number of use cases than you could ever hope to serve with the small number of you know the small number relative or the small number of people inside your building relative to everybody outside uh, with you know infinite amounts of creativity so, so there's always been a lot of tension behind you know developing for a platform that's controlled by someone else. Uh, I've seen that personally with the years we spent at PayPal building on the eBay platform. I think the YouTube folks saw that developing on the MySpace platform. Uh, there's certainly lots of folks who have developed on Facebook. Uh, what's your thoughts these days on kind of new platforms of interest? Um, Just in generally, like what's interesting, or yeah. and and do you even view that as a positive? Would you invest in a company that was building on top of, I don't know, Airbnb or Pinterest or Snapchat? I'm super interested in companies that want to build on Airbnb, uh, but yeah. I'm not seeing very many of them. Um, I, I would really love to invest in companies that are building brands on top of Airbnb, for example. Um, right. Like it makes no sense to me why there's no. Uh, uh, you know, high quality networks of Airbnbs like built out on top of uh, sure. Airbnb with unique differentiated experiences. Like those seem like apps that you could build on top of Airbnb. Right. There's like variety of services. We've invested in services like uh, Pillow, for example, that are Airbnb enabling services. Um, like those are ecosystem related things there. Um, you know, I think that uh, Snapchat's not a platform yet. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it seems like they seem really smart. I'm really impressed with Snapchat. Like I think that, that Do you think the filters kind of market, I don't know if you could call it a market, is a bit of a platform or not even yet? Not really. Um, you know, you could look at the filters market and um, Discover, and those are platforms of a kind, but they're very restrictive. Uh, they're more akin to like what cable looked like in like the right. 80s. And so it's not really something that in you know inspires, say, literally every business in the ecosystem around uh, the system to integrate. So small businesses can't integrate, the you know big businesses can't, software developers of all kinds can't really play ball. So to me, when I think of a platform, I think of is literally every single business that's adjacent to this business like trying to build for it, right? Because you look at iPhone, there's an app for that, right? You look at WeChat yeah. in China, it's like every business from the smallest ones on the street to the biggest ones are, are playing ball in there. And so. Yeah, and, and WeChat certainly has built a platform that does involve monetization, not yeah. just distribution. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like, you know, Facebook. Which in, to your question, I think that's actually the critical question. Well, you know? I mean, we used to argue about this, I think, when Facebook was providing distribution, was, was there, you know, a platform at Facebook to grow users? Yes. 
was there a platform for monetization? No. Not really. Yeah, I mean, we've explicitly made the choice to leave that to developers at the time. And you could argue, was that a good strategic choice? Um, it seems like it was, yes. Like, it worked out for that period of time. It had kind of a sunset to it um, where, you know, Facebook ultimately ended up today that, you know, most people are building off of the platform and using their ad system as distribution. And, you know, that's like a better trade for Facebook. But, um, you know, I think that it's critical actually for a sustainable long-term platform to provide both, right? Like yep. you have to provide a viable and predictable distribution method and you also have to provide uh, in, uh, a monetization uh, method which aligns with the incentives of the platform. So I think Apple's that platform is perfectly example, right? Yep. Developers make apps, they get good distribution through the App Store. Apple makes that ever better. Um, you know, they can also monetize through s now, you know, subscriptions and ads and all kinds of things. And what that does is sell more phones for Apple, right? right. Um, and, and everybody's happy. Yeah, and I think that observation of like providing distribution and monetization, but particularly providing alignment with the parent platform it's is pretty critical. key. Yeah, I mean, it's critical and you've seen it go awry, right? Where the, the, the company- Slide and, uh, you know, a lot of other yeah, companies- Yeah, or the Zynga. entire Twitter ecosystem, for yeah. example, you know? And, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's these companies' faults necessarily. Like, a lot of these things, as we all know, are very unclear in the early days of um, particularly these consumer network systems where, you know, you're not sure where the money's going to come from and what the trades are, in, you know, in the marketplace. And right. at some point, sometimes they, s they shift and, you know, so uh, parts of the ecosystem get eaten because of that. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, maybe Facebook, live video, YouTube, and um, I don't know, is Pinterest a platform? Do you think of those as kind of interesting, you know, playing grounds for new startups? Uh, I think live video on Facebook is really interesting. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's actually the only place that it's interesting um, because the scale is just, I mean, for all of the... Uh, noise that there is about who's winning and all of this. I mean, you can just look at Mary Meeker's presentation from two weeks ago. I mean, Facebook's just in a quadrant of its own, right, from a, from a but, scale perspective. But do you believe that in terms of video? I mean, like, right yes. now, it's still say YouTube is maybe the central place for distribution for video. That might change in a few years, but... I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, so I could be wrong. I'm wrong yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, but I think that Facebook's already out distributing uh, YouTube uh, natively, okay. uh, as far as I can tell from like numbers that I've seen. Um, and, and is Snapchat in that race also? I think so, yeah. I think Snapchat's definitely in that race. Um, I think that Snapchat is, in a lot of ways, a, a totally new medium, you know? Yeah. Um, it's One it's, that I it's kind of its own thing. completely don't understand. I'm pretty sure anybody, anybody over 25 who says they understand Snapchat Probably is lying. I'm, I'm stealing that quote from somebody else, but that was, uh, uh, yeah. I, you're I just, also you over know. 25, so I don't think you actually know what you're doing. Yeah, I think Snapchat's, you know, just brilliant. Yeah. Uh, I mean, while we're talking about platforms, uh, what do you think about Pinterest? Is it uh, is it viable, growing? I mean, uh, certainly a huge amount of interest and in opportunity in Pinterest, you know, last three, four years, but I wonder where it's headed these days. I honestly, I don't know enough uh, about the numbers this or what's we're going on. We're to guys. Is that sorry? Right? Are we guys and we're not allowed to talk about Pinterest? Or no, I mean, look, I love Pinterest. Uh, I'm an investor in Pinterest. I think that Ben is a brilliant product guy. Um, I, I literally don't know enough about the numbers right. to know really where it stands. I mean, it's big. Um, my wife actually runs uh, a media company called Britain Co., uh, yep. which creates. Uh, media and content for uh, female audience. Um, they reach about 100 million uh, American women per month. Uh, they're one of the largest um, media companies on Pinterest, and Pinterest is one of their most critical sources of traffic. And uh, it's been an amazingly, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, yin and yang relationship for Brit right. Co. So I've had kind of a direct uh, line of sight into that. And so, um, and Brit you know, seems to be very happy with it, so. I, I'm sure you're slightly conflicted if you're an investor in Pinterest, but if you had to rank sort of, let's pick five platforms for pictures or video, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Pinterest, Snapchat, and Instagram, what's your top one, two, three out of that group? Uh, 
I just think it's Facebook, and then everything else is like 10, 10 rungs below. So Facebook, 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 and then? Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat. And then Instagram or YouTube? Uh, I do think Instagram's cool. Uh, I put a lot, I like a lot of photography. I mean, are we talking about platforms? I mean, I guess if, I we're, guess what's if the we're talking about a platform for visual things, whether that's video or pictures, and I, and I think we're talking about selling things. We're talking about what? So, I, as an example, Ipsy is a company we're an investor in that's yep. built a huge business, 150, 200 million dollars profitable business, primarily, I would say, on the back of YouTube. Now, they may be active on those other platforms as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say YouTube seems like it's been the primary platform for video and selling in the past. I don't know if that's changed as a result of what you know, Facebook has launched now or, or Instagram. I, I Probably Instagram, yep. uh, I w if, if we're talking about selling. You know, I mean, uh, uh, my last company, Path, we were very active in Southeast Asia. And one of the things that was very surprising and to us, which I'm sure is not surprising to people in this room, um, is the number of Instagram stores the, that exist right. uh, like across Asia. And you know, that's not a phenomenon that we see a lot of in the United States. M or maybe it's more apparent in uh, places that are outside of the, the, <laughs> the blue states. Uh, I'm from Montana, but I don't really see small businesses in Montana, for example, using Instagram like I saw small businesses in Bali using Instagram. But um, my sense is that it's probably Instagram. But again, that's just Facebook. Dave, thanks for spending some time with us here at Pre-Money. Uh, best of luck to you as a, a VC, and uh, best of luck to Britt as an entrepreneur. Thank you.